All right, it's March 21st, 2023, 7.30 p.m. I'm gonna call the regular meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission to order. Members present, myself, John Tehan, Bob Shabbat, Andy Marco, and to alternates, uh, Bill Bennell and Michael Johansson. We'll see Bill Bennell tonight for Joseph Hall and Mike, uh, Michael Johansson for Doug Roberts. All right. Applications for receipt, PZ-23-7, application home occupation for small engine repair at 92 Ruby Road, owner applicant, Sean Gannon. So this is just for receipt. This is uh, will be a special permit request. So we will schedule the hearing and keep all the letters, notifications with the applicant. And okay. okay. It'll probably be on the first meeting in April. We should have enough time. Sounds good. All right, no public hearings tonight under new business, uh, item E, uh, uh, number one, informal discussion, 329 Ruby Road, site build out. So um, Bill Thompson is here um, to kind of talk to the commission. He wants to give a quick update. Um, he was before you guys a couple of months ago with that. <laughs> The um, solar and pad site on Ruby Road right on off the highway. Mm -hmm. So he wants to give a quick update and um, kind of, I guess, pick your brain a little bit um, on some stuff that he's seeing and kind of what he, the progress he's made to date. Um, so I thought it'd be good for him to kind of check in with you guys at this point. And I'll turn it over to Phil and I'll let you, you should be able to share your screen if you need to, Phil. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. And thanks to, to the commission for their time tonight. Um, so just as a reminder, um, we uh, came before uh, the commission several months ago uh, with the proposed site uh, next to the TA truck stop. Um, we have uh, since closed on that property um, and uh, received uh approval from, from the commission to, to develop uh, a retail pad um, in the front of the property uh, abutting Ruby Road um, and are planning to install a ground mount solar array on the remainder of the property. Um, we have uh, are very close to uh, finalizing uh, everything required to pull permits for uh, to begin site construction. Uh, just waiting on final approval on the uh, well location, um, but other than that, have um, have made it through most of most of the process here, um, and have our solar interconnection and incentive uh, with the utility approved. So, uh, have made some good progress to date. Uh, we are actively marketing uh, the property for. Um, a ground lease or build the suit or some retail uh, occupant there. Um, we have uh, signed a lease agreement or a tentative lease agreement with Tesla to locate 16 EV fast chargers on the site, um, which I'm hoping can drive traffic to the area and, and hopefully entice a retail tenant um, of some credit quality to uh, to take take the site, um, you know, initial feedback to date has really been, um, you know, concerns about the reliance upon highway traffic um, uh, to drive traffic to to a retail operator there, like a quick service restaurant. Had a number of discussions with a lot of the national franchises, um, and have had some traction. Um, we're hoping to get Starbucks out to, to visit uh, in mid to late April. Uh, but the initial kind of pushback is, has really been in reliance upon the highway traffic and, and um, concerns about lack of signage for the property. Um, so it hasn't, it hasn't necessarily inhibited activity yet, but um, I just wanted to anticipate um, a potential uh, tenant's request to, uh, to have some sort of visibility from the highway. Um, and um, we, we, we have gotten, uh, believe it or not, DOT approval. Uh, I'm sharing my screen here. Can everybody see it? 
Yeah. So we have gotten DOT approval to um, clear some of this vegetation here and and regrade a little bit on on DOT. This is DOT property, like you know, about fifty feet or or so from the actual pavement there. Um, to allow some visibility from E westbound, I suppose. Um, but, you know, I'm just thinking ahead um, and wanted to pick the commission's brain on, you know, potential the potential to remove some trees in this area and post signage that would be more visible from um, both uh, lanes on, on 84. Uh, you know, it's it's not something we've broached with the DOT yet, but we do have their ear um, and they've been receptive to helping us out with the site in, in, in this location. So, um, you know, just wanted to to gauge, you know, potential, um, you know, pushback or, or thoughts from the commission on on highway visibility signage. Um, which, again, would would, I believe, be something along this line where, where this is kind of an elevated location off of off of the highway. Um, and I think if we were able to clear, you know, 50 to 80 feet of, of um, vegetation and trees there, we could probably get a decent shot at both sides of traffic. Um, you know, I know, you know, obviously a, a high pylon would, would be visible, but you know, I, I'm not sure that would be um, appealing for the town or or something that you'd be receptive to. But um, just trying to think through some ideas to get ahead of tenant requests for for signage. Hey, Phil, uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's Commissioner John Tian. Um, okay. Just. Um, do you have any, or, or would you be able to produce any kind of like a, a rendering of what this would look like from the perspective of the highway? Sure. Yeah, I think we could probably uh, take some drone footage to show uh, to show what it would look like. I, uh, I think that, that'd be really helpful. I think. Yeah. Yeah. In principle, like you know, I I can see the need for being able to see the sign from the highway for the business to be successful to draw, especially if they're concerned most of the traffic's gonna come from the interstate. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it would be helpful to actually see some sort of a rendering. Mm -hmm. Got if it. I, if I just could jump in, when I was talking to Bill about this and we were we were running through the rags, I, I told him there's kind of two separate things. I mean, obviously, it's possible DOT will ask us if we have an opinion on clearing within there right away, but that's between them and DOT. Mm -hmm. But there may, there's a the issue of obviously this commission would determine if it's appropriate to locate a sign on on that part of the property, and they would come for you to you, and if you thought it was appropriate, you could approve the location. Um, separate from that is the height of the sign, the size of the sign, right? The size of the sign, but really when you're dealing with what we have for TA and loves, the height of the sign is a bigger, sort of a bigger ask, not necessarily because I think it's unreasonable or, or that it is you know, not something that would be supportive of the business, but because we have these other businesses that are already there, we have to sort of be uniform in that. Mm -hmm. We have more flexibility on the location of the, the sign and the size. I think the harder thing though we could, per, per, probably get there um, would be would be height. Um, mm -hmm. So we talked about looking at visibility and the location of the ground mount as a trade-off for needing to have something that was 100 feet in the air. Right, right. Um, yeah, that's, that's still pretty far away from the highway. Yeah. It's, well, it's, 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 a little sign doesn't really yeah. show up too well. Right. Uh, one of the things that Love's uh, dealt with is obviously the size of the sign that they have for their facility. And what I've noticed on the highway, as you're approaching the exit at Ruby Road, they've taken advantage of uh, the uh, highway signs that alerts everybody to what's at this coming up exit. So they have their Lowe's logo on a, on a 
you know, a, sure. a, DOT a, sign. a, a quarter, yeah. a DOT sign. And yeah. I, I, that would be my suggestion that anyone coming on this site should yeah. certainly uh, try to address that with DOT. So coming up on this exit, they would have their sign on, on the uh, highway sign as well. You know, yeah. on, on both way, both, you know, east and west on, right. on, on the exit. Uh, so at least people have a heads up and then they can be looking for the smaller sign uh, or the larger sign as they come up to the exit uh, sure. to, to alert them. Uh, as, as far as DOT, with you guys talking about removing trees uh, right at the end of the ramp and near Ruby Road, I think that's a plus because we could use a little bit more visibility up towards the truck stop coming off of that exit. Yeah. 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 I'm hoping that will, that will benefit kind of everybody in the area coming off um, <clears throat> for sure, especially considering how visible love is from the other side. Uh, yeah. And to your point on the DOT signs there, there's currently a little bit of space left on, on, I believe the eastbound, um, but until you until you have a tenant in place, um, you know that can go away. Um, yeah. That availability can go away, so tenants don't often rely upon that unless there's a you know tons of blank space on them. Um, but um, we did look into that. We have looked into the billboards um, in the area, which are currently full, but you know exploring those options uh, as well. Uh, thanks for thanks for noting that. Philip, when you reached out, we're reaching out to see what kind of potential uh, businesses may be interested in the site. Did anybody bring up the fact there's already restaurants and some in the truck stops? Yeah, yeah, they certainly have brought up the you know the the usual suspects of like Dunkin' Donuts and Subway, which are are large franchise footprints. Obviously, have have the uh, the presence here, um, so you know, I think there's there's still quite a bit of um, you know un unmet demand potentially. Um, I think there's still a spot for a for a quick service restaurant tenant there, uh, but you know we're we're pretty flexible on on what we want to put there or what we can put there. You know, I'm not dead set on any particular tenant. I really like to have someone in there that's that's one generating. Um, you know, as much traffic for the area um, for, you know, local sales and use tax um, or as an asset for the community. Um, so, you know, I'm somewhat different on, on tenant there. Um, it just seems that, you know, the transient traffic quick service restaurant type profile is going to make the most sense, but totally open to, to anyone really. Um, yeah. It's it's a piece of the equation for me in addition to the solar. So um, I'm I'm very receptive to to any sort of business there. I think the solar the the electric charging stations is going to be a draw. Anybody that has an electric vehicle has the app because sometimes they're pretty far and in between. Yeah, that's uh, right. Will the um, will the chargers only work on Teslas or will they work on all three major types of chargers? Um, so there, uh, there's going to be 12 to 16 Tesla chargers. Tesla's reserved the right for two additional spaces for um, uh, universal chargers, but not the fast chargers. So they, you know, I, I don't know if this is public yet, but like they're they may open it up to universal chargers for level two, which is the slower, like 20 to 40 kW chargers. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I also have incentive applications in with Eversource for um, universal fast chargers separately. Um, so, you know. Off, off the highway, get... you only want fast chargers. Nobody's going to want to sit there for hours. So Exactly. Yeah. I mean, this is, it's like a charger desert between Charlton or Sturbridge <laughs> and, and Hartford, really, or south of Hartford even. Um, I have one in my garage. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't share it. <laughs> yeah, right, right. 
So yeah, we're, we're hoping to get a couple uh, universal fast chargers in there if I get the incentive from Eversource uh, secured. Um, but I wanted to get Tesla in there to drive one drive track to take the site and entice a retail tenant to, mm-hmm. to bite. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah you certainly, yeah. certainly would be filling a niche because like you said, between Sturbridge and Hartford, there's nothing. Yeah. That's, that's what we're hoping. They, I was surprised they jumped on it pretty quickly. So Tesla did. So <laughs> yeah. I guess they saw what we saw. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm reasonably optimistic, but um, I will, I'll, I'll put something together that uh, more clearly illustrates, I guess, visibility from the highway um, or kind of estimates what that could look like with 60 to 100 foot cleared and size of size of signage that, you know, we would need to be visible um, and um, try to keep the height down as much as possible. It sounds like that's important given the precedent that's been set with Loves and TA. Um, so we'll, we'll work on that um, and come back to you with, with something more specific. Um, are there any other kind of guidelines we should be operating in? Um, you know, I'm not privy to exactly what was discussed when, when Lo- I assume Loves was looking for a big old, you know, 100 foot pylon. Um, but um, did you put that, any restric- that, specific restrictions on them that you don't want to violate or, you know? Well, now that yeah. I'm thinking about what you're doing here, Phil, um, mm-hmm. it's, it's odd that you'd want to be able to let people see it from both sides of the highway, since if they want to um, get off from the westbound side they have to know about it about a mile north of here yeah so you know seeing the sign by the time they see the sign on the westbound side they're going they're going they're driving past it totally yeah i mean we want to we want to track eastbound traffic and we're we're going to have some visibility to the site from this location so yeah that westbound's less i guess yeah westbound is less important um but um you know some something like here-ish, you know, a, a, a shot right around there is going to either there or even just a little bit yeah. like that is going to give us some, some decent visibility to people. Right. A half mile, three quarters of a mile from the exit ramp um, mm-hmm. on the eastbound side. So always good to have visibility from both, of course, but um Right. You know, the focus is going to be on kind of this yeah. location, I think. I suppose the folks going west are going to be coming back east. So, right. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I appreciate everybody's time. Um, and uh, we'll put a little bit more into this and, um, and come back to you. Thanks for okay. checking. Bye. Thank you. Mike, did you have something? Yeah. I, I was just going to say, I think that the easiest thing might be if you either take the site plan and like you said, some drone photos or whatever, if you put together, I guess what I can call the ask, what you think you need to make the project work from mm-hmm. there, I can look at it and I can compare it to the regs and we can, we can, um, start to look at if there are issues with the regs or if this is compliant or, we can like chart the path forward from there based upon what you think you need. We can see if it aligns with the regs or if not and talk about what those options are. But if you put together what, what you have in your head and what it might look like, that'll allow us to back into the process and then the commission will see kind of what you're looking for as far as clearing location, et cetera. But from a code perspective, that would be easiest for me. Okay, yeah, we will do. I don't want to speak on behalf of the commission, but that, no, that's, that's a good way to do it. You know, it's another thought. Um, a lot of people that drive electric cars are really pre-planning their trip. And there's apps that tell you where locations are. Mm-hmm. And they tell you if the chargers are working, if there's a backlog there. And so people can be looking ahead, um, you know, miles ahead before they see a sign to get information as to whether or not this is going to be available for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's true. Um, it's the you know the the EV traffic will be a piece, but you know we like to draw a broader 
as much of that highway audience as we can. You know, we've got the truck, obviously, from it's a you know, great site for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, the truck stops, traffic, the 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 lack of other options in the area. Um, you know, the EV is a piece of it, but um, would like to get in a, as broad of a given the reliance on the highway traffic as many as many um, transient folks as we can. Great. Well, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Okay. No unfinished business tonight. Approval of minutes from uh, March 7th, 2023. Nobody should have a copy. I don't have a copy. It wasn't in that meeting material link. You should be able to hit it right from where the agenda is posted. If not, uh, I can try to we do this. I see just minor stuff like Lawrence Becker spelled wrong on page one, L-A-W-R-A-N-C-E, things like that. But yeah, I, I, I saw that in one of the applications, that's how it was spelled. Um, I'm not sure based on ownership. Let me just see if this to Jen. Mike, that's um that link has taken me to wellingtonct.gov slash PZC apps, which doesn't have the minutes in it. I just, I just uh sent you the link to the minutes in the chat here. You should be able to pull oh, them in the right. chat, okay. Thanks. I'll move to approve the minutes as written. I'll second it. Let's pull them up for the spell. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, okay. still on. Thanks, Joe. Post Joe here, we see Bill Bennell or Doug Rob or something. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, correspondence, nothing. We have no correspondence. Okay. Item I public participation items not listed on the agenda. Anyone tonight? Nick Teller. Hey, Nick, Nick Teller, 49 Myrtle. Um, I like the back and forth with the developer there. That was that was pretty cool to say, working with him. Um, one thing that I see on the radar uh, coming up maybe in the next year or two, but I at least wanted to get out there on the record, is um, potential concern of tactics being used by the fire department uh, when they eventually maybe come to you for a uh, new fire building. I see that they're going to be trying to ask for two uses on one piece of the property over there to try to uh, avoid splitting the parcel um, because if they split the parcel they're going to be running into setback issues for a new new building just wanted to get that out there on the on the radar it's probably not for another year or two but at least start putting it in people's brains um, and heads so that's all i have thanks thanks nick uh ralph toolis oh, ralph toolis 47 village Hill road uh I'm inquiring about 335 River Road. Uh, quite some time ago, uh, I had filed a complaint about the accumulation of uh, vehicles and the overall condition of the site. 
And uh, Mr. D'Amato's response at that time was he was working with the owner, um, but that was quite some time ago. Uh, and, and I don't see any action at cleaning up that site. Uh, it's detrimental to Dunkin' Donuts, uh, never mind their own management at Dunkin' Donuts. And that's an editorial comment, by the way. Um, but it'd be nice to know what the plan is for that property and hopefully see it cleaned up soon. Uh, thanks. Thank you, uh, Ralph. James Marshall. Hey, good evening, guys. James Marshall, 46 Fisher Hill Road, uh, speaking personally as a resident of the town and not on behalf of any boards or committees I may serve on. Um, I'm a couple of meetings behind here, but I did want to um, um, raise a disappointment in, or quite frankly concern at the level of investment in the uh, debate or the forum between the EDC and uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission related to the Strategic Development Zone Regulation. Um, you know, as somebody who invested um, quite a bit of time um, and had some level of understanding that there was going to be a robust community uh, input, opportunity for community input, perhaps the um, involvement of the um, Conservation Commission and, and kind of a robust debate about the needs of this uh, SDZ, it wound up being, um, you know, a two-member invitation of the two members of the EDC that form a quorum nowadays uh, for the EDC, talking about um, transforming the SDZ regarding the merits of a particular speculative project. Um, I do hope moving forward, um, knowing that we're under a moratorium, that this commission, because this is really falls on you, accurately vets and you know goes back and listens and evaluates all of the conversation and feedback that was a part of all of the prior um, applications related to the SDZ, as well as the um, warehouse development. There is an opportunity. I hope there's there's much more opportunity for actual um, buy-in and conversation with the public. And um, honestly, before anything related to the SEC happens for, uh, further, I really do hope that all the underlying uh, concerns that may need to be resolved in the underlying zoning code are additionally taken care of, things such as size and area limitations. Um, and then ultimately that as we address these in the SEC as well, and actually look to form an SDZ or, you know, development regulations in town that are appropriate and effective to what this town wants. Um, you guys serve the people and resoundingly, you know, I've heard nothing but wanting to limit industrial development as a town-wide possibility. Um, so just, I ask that you please be, continue to be cognizant about the regulations you put forth. So thank you very much. Good night. Anything else from the public? All right, item J, staff report discussion. Item one, home occupation regulations review and discussion. Everybody hear me all right? All right, so I believe you should have a copy in front of you, but following our conversation from a couple of meetings back um, regarding home occupations. I drafted up um, a regulation, which is essentially exactly what is there now. I've reformatted it um, and reworded um, things to make a little more sense. Um, I've changed, the major thing I changed was again, the the whole issue with yearly renewals. Um, I changed that to read um, as reviews by the commission and staff every year instead of requiring that they expire. Um, there's a new section called baseline prohibitions, which those all come from the definition. Um, I thought it didn't really make sense or was um, kind of confusing that those um, prohibitions were in the definition in the front of the book, but they didn't actually show up in the actual regulation. So I brought them forward based on what the definition says and made a section in the regulation. Um, and then the, the other major thing, um, and I kind of took this, we were talking about Tallinn's regulation last time. Um, I got this from them was 
that home occupations aren't really defined exactly in our regulation or not home occupations, home offices. Um, so I added that in as its own section. Um, if I can scroll to it. Um, so home offices would be allowed in um, all zones without a, a permit. Um, so those are the major changes I made. Aside from that, everything content wise is the exact same as it is just reworded to be a little less clunky. Um, so I guess if you guys want to read through that and, you know, let us know what you think and um, we can go from there in terms of um, switching it up and incorporating other changes. Do you have a link to that, Chris? I don't have a copy of it. I'm sorry. Um, I just sent it. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, we're trying to transition all of the documents for the meeting materials. You, the, the agendas are being created in OpenGov now, and we're trying to transition into moving so that everything kind of links back there. So we're kind of in between both. Um, I, uh, I also, I believe Peggy printed copies of the Tallinn um, home occupation regulation because we were using that as a comparison last time in our conversation. Um, just so you guys can reference that. So I think one of the, the main feedback points is the, the sort of going rate for how you handle home occupations now across you know most towns or that you have one type, which is the guy who is a work for himself tax person. He has no employees. He doesn't have anybody, you know, any traffic of any kind. It's just basically a home office where he's got a computer. And in most cases, those are allowed, you know, by a by right or with a specific zoning permit. Then you have a minor home occupation, which is stuff that requires some review, but is more or less um, something that no one's going to know about. And we don't need to have them come back every single year and pay an application fee just to say, you know, I've been doing this for X number of years. I don't have employees, et cetera. Maybe they have a vehicle or something. Um, and then the major home occupations, which are the ones like you'd see now, which require specific reviews and may require conditions based upon the scope or the scale, et cetera. Um, and so the key to sort of adjusting the format, I think, is number one, to see kind of what it would look like. This doesn't really move the needle as far as what requires permits um, or change the content. I think it presents it in a way that's easier to understand what is actually required in using the table, but also some of the folks that currently renew their, their home occupations with us every single year for doing nothing more than basically having a computer um, would take them away from having to file a permit application every year and renewing it. Um, So incrementally not wanting to get to a point where even just the structure doesn't match what you think makes sense or, you know, at least if we can start with a layout and, and structuring it in with those three categories, we can rough it out and then you guys can decide, do we like the criteria and we just leave it? We, one of the things we do need to adjust regardless is the, is the time frames because we, you can't tell someone that they don't come back after a year, their permit is an ongoing special permits are like variances. Mm -hmm. So we want to be able to dem have them demonstrate compliance, um, but it's not really a renewal. Um, so that's something that, you know, at a minimum we need to adjust. And if we like the way everything else is, we can certainly leave that and we can reformat it if you think it makes more sense this way. But um, the compliance review is something 
you know, that at least um, puts it on their radar and, and adding more time based on the minor home occupations, again, makes it so they're not coming back every single year. And those, those time frames can be adjusted up or down. A lot of towns will say, we'll give you a permit for a year and then you come back after a compliance check for three years and then you come back again and it's five years and sort of as you demonstrate your ability to operate in conformance with the regs, you don't have to come back as frequently. It's not as complicated for us to track now because we have a permitting system so we can actually set expirations and, and we can set those deadlines, but wanted to and Chris, you looked at a, several towns, right? You looked at Holland and some of the other surrounding towns and some, some yeah. half a dozen or so towns that you looked at <coughs> pulling together the format. Tolland, Ashford, Stafford, Ellington. I think it makes sense to establish categories. You know, it's... Um, no different than what we we're talking about uh, um, warehouses, understanding what warehouses are, the different styles. And I think this breakdown identifies it's basically what we have now. Yeah, because we don't have a marked up copy in front of us here. It changes. Right. Yeah. It's really there's no, it's really the exact language in that last those last pages are verbatim right. what we have now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the main thing I think was, and you know. I got this from Tallinn and a couple of the other towns, the home office thing, you know, a lot of, we didn't really specifically speak to that in our regulations, but a lot of towns just like it is here, don't require a permit for a home office. Like Mike said, something where you would just have a computer, you know, something like that, doing taxes or things of that nature. Well, it's easier to understand. Yeah. 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 I tried to reword things too, to be a little less clunky. Yeah. I see on the table where you take the one year out and the commission's discretion or two years for the major. Mm -hmm. They go to one year. The minor is three years. Mm -hmm. Home office, not obviously none. I agree. Yeah. I agree. One of the things that we can look at, and I know we talked about this when we initially brought it up. Um, I haven't seen it exactly for home occupations, but I, I have written regulations that are um, sometimes they'll you'll see them referred to as like impact based. Um, so on the commercial side, a restaurant with less than 20 seats and no drive-through would require a site plan more than 20 seats or with a drive-through or with an outdoor patio would might require a special permit. So one of the things we could look at, because I think this is the piece that we do need to think about is where the ceilings are between the categories. So a restaurant's not a home occupation. No, but yeah, yeah I just, that was the best example okay. I could come up with. But if someone is in a minor home occupation land and let's say they're performing a specific um, use that's allowed, at what point does that size, scale, the scope of that grow to the point where now you ought to come back for a special permit because we need to look at things. So we could look at... Well, here's the major uh, home occupation stuff should address that, right? Yeah, so I think what we would want to yeah. do is build in a trigger so that a, a home business or a minor home occupation, at some point, if things grow and they do well, which is what we want, yeah they then trigger something that says, okay, now we want to look at it because you've got, maybe now you have external evidence. Maybe now you've got employees. Those are things you can't plan for. 
I say myself as a business owner, I didn't expect that you would be, I would be hiring employees, but you have to. And so as the businesses grow, we need to provide a way for them to see what the expectations are. So rather than saying, you've got employees and you're in violation of your home occupation, we can say, hey, now you need a special permit. So I think that's something that's missing. Um, so maybe we can look at how to establish some of those trigger points, not really looking at uses, but looking at if they grow a specific size or if employees change or outdoor storage starts occurring or whatever. Um, well, that's where you run into trouble, right? When, when you start like putting up buildings, like and right. storing things, and exactly that's from the neighbors. A small detached garage might not be an issue, but then if you need to put up a forty by sixty barn on top, you know, in, you story. and that was one of the things yeah. that came up during the previous home occupation permit is sort of when does a home occupation become a commercial business in the right. residential zone, right. and we don't have clear caps for that. Um, so that may be something we, we think about. That's what we want to do. This was for discussion purposes tonight. Uh, yeah, just to... For but Chris I, think, to I think we're heading in the right direction. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and I, I think your points are well taken, Mike. There, there does have to be some triggers in the regulations. So it's a clear... The people that are involved in home occupation have a clear understanding of when they're getting to the edge of what they're permitted for. Yeah, I agree. Okay. So do you want us to try to figure out what those triggers might look like so, as a sort of a next step? Um, well, I guess these this other handout from six page 16 to 18, these are towns. I towns, guess. yep. I mean, you know, I've been looking at that and can we can we uh, pull some of those uh, things in? Some of it is more restricted than ours. Some of things about. Well, I mean, yeah. I, I think yeah. the um, well, we don't have to be more restrictive. But at least I think there's several of these where there's there are definitely triggers yeah. that are in there. But this is clearly written up the way it reads. And I think, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I touched yeah. upon this last time too because it was actually a question just of my own accord for my registered company within Wilmington. Mm -hmm. You know, I use my home as my primary business address. I don't have customers come to us, but my equipment comes home with me at night and into my garage. So, where do I essentially myself, like other people like me, fall into? these categories, classifications and such, because it seems like it's another gray area. It is um, because there's a lot of that going where people bring stuff home and what in one of the other notes that I just made is that we need to look at and perhaps figure out a way to incorporate how the commercial vehicle definitions play into this. One of the rubs I think that sometimes comes up with the town regs are that they have um, some, what I would say are very relaxed regulations pertaining to commercial vehicles. And that can create a little bit of frustration amongst property owners just because, and so they're leaning in the direction of like, like a lot of area of towns in this area, we don't have a lot of commercial space. People don't have the ability to just rent a shop so they can park a truck. And so they are more flexible of what they allow. But the other thing that our regulations have, which many regulations don't, is specific ratios for how big your accessory building can be based on your house. So you, you can't necessarily build a big barn, put an RV in and a, and a work truck and a boat, or because it you can't direct to prohibit it. So there's a lot of stuff that comes into play with that. Um, based upon what you're talking about, you know, I think <laughs> it potentially could go for a home occupation, but because you have equipment, but there's no external evidence of the business. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to fight something that I'm yeah. part of, so I'm trying to find out uh, where would say, that would kind of classify as a minor home occupation. Which I, I mean, if I need to register, I'm not opposed yeah. to that. Just kind of like I'm, I'm reading it, like well, right. I actually fall on it, yeah. like not, and that's where there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of <laughs> well. 
Exactly. Around town, a lot of small contractors yeah. and things like that. And I think what, what we want to do is make life extremely unpleasant for people trying to make a living. Right, exactly. And especially people that aren't bothering their neighbors. They're just you know making a living. Right. Yeah. That's the intent at all. No. You know, to, to go down right. that road. I think the intent would be actually for those folks that have been doing it forever and aren't bothering anybody and don't have a permit and we haven't had any problems to make the regs sort of reflect that those folks don't actually need a permit. They're rather than flying under the radar and, and that's fine for everybody, those smaller uses that those one guys are just trying to earn a living don't have some other obligation that they need to come in yearly for something that they've been doing forever. And you know, it's another story when you have trucks with the name of the business on it, right. like, you know, on yeah. the, you know, like what we dealt with a few months ago. Yeah, you know, that's different. Yep. Okay. All right. We'll keep trying to refine yeah, this a bit more. I think there's some opportunity here. Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that seems to come up with that home office permit is that there's a, an inventory that goes out every year yeah. that lists, you know, equipment that's being used by the home office, by the home business. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of a permit for a home office. That's kind of a revenue stream too, because yeah. You're, you're paying tax, mm -hmm. some, a small tax, it's usually a few hundred bucks on, you know, the equipment that you're using. Uh, when I had a landscaping business, I, I paid tax on to my trailer, my trucks, my, uh, not my truck, my mowers and things like that. You're talking about personal property tax from personal the property tax, yeah. but that's also driven by that, by that uh, home office application. For home business application, but yeah, home office doesn't require a zoning permit. Home business, yeah, yeah, yeah office different. Hey, I'm yeah, not that's what you're referring to a minor home occupation, right? Yeah. yeah, and I'm not sure where she pulls that data from because she doesn't get it from us. Um, as far as I'm aware, we've never provided it. She has a she has a list that she distributes the personal property declarations to on, a, on an annual basis, and my suspicion is she gets it partially from the state and maybe she pulls trade name certificates. I'm not sure how she gets that total universe of, of, of um, business owners, but unless I've missed it, I know Chris, we haven't, Tara nor Walter never specifically asked for it, for that list. No. Yeah. So I'm not sure where they get that from. Um, we, they can share some of that information with us, but the declarations themselves, we can't see. We could we could certainly see who, but what business names have filed them. Um, yeah, that's a whole whole process that they deal with. All right. We uh, anything else? Uh, no, we're going to think about this, digest this a bit. Joe, you have anything? I'm good. Okay. All right. I'm good too. All right. Just want to make sure we pay attention to our friends online. <laughs> All right. Uh, two, codification, regulation, revisions, process. So um, I talked about. Uh, maybe two meetings ago um, that the request that we submitted, our department submitted with the town clerk's office for the codification of regulations and ordinances and that that legal review that um, we submitted to ARPA was approved. Um, we, we are now in the point where we'll basically have to solicit and bid and go through the procurement process, but um, it sort of occurred to me that we have, we've talked about accessory dwelling units, we've talked about home occupations, we've talked about signage, um, we have, you know, various parts of the regulations which have come up, which we've either started working on, we're in the process of doing revisions for, or we sort of have flagged as, as knowing that we need to. Um, and the, the process for codification will involve us providing them a document they'll go through an organizational review, then they'll go through a legal analysis, and then from there, give us feedback. But we sort of know we're gonna get feedback on a certain things already, and it seems silly to send it through a review process only to get back, and they're gonna say, hey, you should consider changing 
this and this because this doesn't comply with the statute or this is you know so my thought was because we've got all these things in the hopper was to kind of pick your brain on should we should we essentially start going through sort of top to bottom and not do a comprehensive overhaul because that's that's a significant effort but but run through and 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 start looking to adjust article by article the stuff that we know is going to come up anyway so when we hand them a document that's for for the codification to begin it's a little bit closer to what we probably want to adopt um, rather than kind of going from a home occupation to signs to adus and just kind of start the first chapter and, and go through um, because what they'll do is they're going to give you, us back a list of recommendations and they're going to say these are your options. You can say, we'll do nothing with this for now, or they're gonna give us a suggestion for a revision, or they're gonna ask us how we wanna revise it. And we don't necessarily wanna start workshopping a bunch of text changes at that point. Who, who's they? Who? The, the codifier, whoever the town ultimately. Whoever the right. Just whoever, whoever, right. whoever that vendor is. That so if this not. is to bring these more into line with the new state, you know. It'll be a regular, a legal analysis, so it'll be in line with statute, stuff but also they're going to analyze our ordinances to see if there are things that we have that conflict so i mean there are i i already know that we've got problems because our regs say you need to get a driveway permit and reference a driveway ordinance the town has no driveway ordinance never has so they're going to say you need to figure this out you either need to adopt an ordinance or revise your language because you're asking to get a permit in accordance with adopt with a set of guidelines that doesn't exist um, so they're also going to look at our regulations internally and say these things conflict. Um, so it'll be both. <laughs> Start going through uh, paragraph by paragraph, article by article. We got about a year's worth of work there. Yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, I would be looking to hit the high points and and adjust some of the things that we've talked about and sort of. Put some of that work in because the codification process is not going to happen in two or three months so we can get ahead of it and get started maybe there's stuff that's too big right like the sdz discussion that we started with edc we certainly are not going to solve that problem while we go through codification so that would be one where we'd say we'll put a placeholder there and, and we'll move on but smaller stuff signage so stuff like that i think we can we can kind of hit some of the more High level things. Um, well, what's the fee structure? Do they do they pay by opinion? I mean, it's a whole thing of like <clears throat> sometimes it's easier just to go go through the inspection. Whatever the inspector says, you got to change. They've done your work for you. They right. just laid out your agenda. Now you don't have to sweat those details that aren't important. Where we might be hung up on something, we spend a lot of time on it, mm -hmm. and they go, "Well, that's not important. This is important." We go, "We didn't know that." Yeah, I'm wondering what's the best course of action then they they will largely base their fee on the size of the document so if any re, any revisions we do which reduce length then that will reduce cost sure, that, that, that's what i was thinking but other than that no i mean they're going to review for those those really important legal issues and conflicts with language that we have both within the document or mm -hmm. in the ordinance they're not necessarily going to review for something that i guess you could chalk up to like a like a best practice they're not going to say gee you're requiring everybody to come before you for a home occupation you ought to rethink that they're not going to right, right. go that far yeah, um, yeah. but because that's what we want we have that that is our purview to do that so yeah but if there's conflicts with regulate uh, with state statutes and that's where we should start the ones we know there's an issue. well that's right exactly right and, and, if, and if some of these things that yeah. we work on that we haven't even really landed on yet mm -hmm. you might as well finish yeah. those up Right. And say, this is what yeah. we want. And then we find out where it's conflict. The biggest, the biggest and most recent conflict point, which, which is, which will show up throughout the document will be the PA 2129 stuff, which is pertaining to minimum house size, um, accessory dwelling units, yeah. um, parking standards for multi, multi um, unit dwellings. Um, get some of the other stuff, outdoor dining, that whole table that we looked at year ago um that's the probably the biggest point that will come up and, and there's a lot of low-hanging fruit there um, that we could easily chip away at the adu stuff will come up but we opted out so we don't have 
the deadline looming like we did, mm -hmm. but so we're not in conflict necessarily because we did opt out, but some of the other stuff um, we can't opt out from. Content neutral sign regs, that will likely come up. We already know that we've got to work on that and, and make pretty good progress, but it's a sort of a complicated thing mm -hmm. to try to deal with, but always has been. You don't want to have a document that ultimately gets codified be sort of already right to, to be reviewed again because we've got so many things there. But I, I just wanted to bring it up because we talked about multiple sections and when we go through this, they're going to start at the top and work through. Um, so I just wanted to get a sense from you guys as far as what you thought was the most logical way to proceed forward. So we're not kind of jumping all around the dock. We're the ones that are probably mo the most out of compliance. Yeah. That's probably where we should start. And yeah, I agree. We don't have the time with this process to do a line by line. And I don't necessarily know that we need to. If we went line by line through the entire zoning yeah. book, there's probably a lot of things like we we tweak and everything, you know, because there many of them were written like 50 years ago. Remember how long it took yeah. us to do the yeah, open space. Yeah, open space. We went line, we, we did a mock trial, we did a whole bunch of stuff on that one. It took a long, long time. Should we dedicate time on the agenda, like set aside 30 minutes? I mean, just for this. I mean, at least then. It's it's discussed in a public forum. It is in an extra meeting. We know that we have every meeting we will be discussing for maybe it's 50, it doesn't matter. I mean, mm -hmm. we can be incremental. But yeah, it we might, should we should might be enough time to make a little progress. Yeah, right, right. We make a progress every yeah. meeting rather than say, oh, we're gonna have an extra meeting and throw all our efforts on it. It gets a little mind boggling. So I don't know if it's more that way. Yeah, right, right. right. We, if you put it on the agenda one thing and we and then we get that, then we move right. On. And then we say, okay, yeah. that's that done. Way, that's done. Eventually, we're doing things that we could say, hey, we yeah. accomplished this one. Yeah. We start out, we go all over the map. Off a little yeah. Bit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right, little by little. So, what so if they working at home? I don't know how quickly we might do this. But what if to start, we put together just a total revision list? Our Perfect. our expectation yeah. of these are the things we think you ought to consider. Okay. And from there, you can say. This is easy, or whoa, this is a lot, or let's do this right, one. Like, right. uh, I like mission can decide we work on this part first. Okay, so we'll okay. try to put together that list as soon as we can. That's a good way there. to start. And if you could do some priori priorities, like you said, there may be some that have a yep. more of a priority or a time that are more time sensitive than others. Yeah. If that if that if it's obvious, you might as well put those on top. Okay, we'll work on that. All right, John, uh, Joe, you agree with that approach? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Yeah, likewise. Good, good idea. All right, item number three: Phelps Plaza signage. Hmm. What are we wow. looking for? So this kind of it just came in, and and um, I wanted to. That's our point of the last like two decades. Yeah. So, well, hopefully not. It's really, this is just more of a what are your what are your thoughts or in recollection. So yeah. um, the we did change it a couple of years ago at least. Right. Yeah. So so back in 2021, I believe. Yeah. yeah mid mid 2021, when lots and more occupied the site and they bought the property. They came before you with their signage person and went through and, and at that point the commission decided um, we don't feel the need to obligate all the signs to look be this wood with the red and the that gold. you can't see from four right. feet away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so he presented some renderings at that point and showed the commission the lots and more sign and then some of the other signs that they were going to be working to replace. They showed a replacement pylon sign, which was the same size, but just looked a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, and I, the, the kind of where we are now is that um, the cannabis place is ready for their sign. And they're asking, you know, what type of permit they need. And what I am not completely clear on and, and not going to make the decision on either way on my own is if, if that uh application when, when he came before you and showed the plaza 
was your understanding that all of those signs would fall in with sort of fall under that application or do you still want to see individual applications for each sign? So the regulations and again that section out so you can see it is I'm reading, reading it myself. Basically have limits for the signs that can be approved and then allow the commission to issue a approval for greater sign area for specific properties and, and what, what is something uh, according to how many square feet so that's how it would normally be written yes and then there's a max like in a traditional development you have a max of 100 square feet or based upon building frontage whichever is less but then for commercial uh, specific let me see here hold on if you look at the bottom of this page, um, greater sign area, an increase in total combined square footage of all signs in any lot in, in the unified development exceeding the total above provided. Um, each individual sign complies with the size and other limitations of the regulations and B, all signs on the lot are determined to be a single unified team, etc. And then if you can read on from there, it says that the, the issue of theme is enforced by the tenant, not, not the town. Um, there's some issues with that because you're getting a little bit into content-based stuff, but um, the I can also what I can also hand out to you is sort of what they have mailed over. Um, Do they have a rendering of yes? The yep. Do they have a name of their business yet? Yes, it's called Higher Collective. <laughs> at least that's what it says very clever yeah um they have to go and meet all the state requirements for signage the so state has all kinds of things that they the state has regulated a, a lot of the content related to this industry in ways that the town cannot um so they have two units there their total linear frontage is 55 square feet or 55 linear feet um they're asking for a sign there, which is approximately 15. Um, but I'm a little bit uh, on the Mike, fence. Do you, do you have a link for this stuff? Because I don't have a copy. Let Sorry. me see if we have it. Hold on. Yeah, same here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Andy. <laughs> and and really, yeah, I'll, I'll, let me see. I should be able to. So. Just trying to help. <laughs> the point here is I don't want to bring them in front of you for another application if if you felt that when the plaza came before you previously that we were discussing signage and totality because it is one piece of property. So they also don't want to say you don't need to come before them. Right, right. I mean, I think this looks kind of nice, but then as always, we say if we allow it for one, then we're allowing it for everyone. So if people want to change their signs, you can't very well say no after the fact. So, but I, I don't know. I, I don't get too hung up on signs. I know I know it matters a lot to other people. I know I don't. I, I, well, it, it personally, I don't. I don't well, know. I, 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 then you get into I, a situation. Then you get into a situation where it could be where the owner of the plaza yeah. wants everything to be uniform. Yeah. I, yeah. We, yeah. I mean, I don't, I'm not opposed to individual businesses having their own characteristics of right, their signage. Right. It, it certainly sets them yeah, right. Apart. That's right. That's what, that's what draws the uh, attention. I think, you know, then you get, you know, what's the gray area between the owner of the plaza versus the individual right. uh, businesses? I, my, my thought about signs is like any of the zoning stuff, as long as you're not impinging on somebody else's rights, whether it's views or, or obstructions or lighting, light intrusion or whatever, then probably okay, but that's, uh, that's subject to the beholder. So. Right. so they're asking for a sign up on the, on the peak of the building. Whatever that little sign is, it's like some sort of balloon airship with Happy little people in it. No, you know, those are right. clouds. Okay. clouds. Okay. I can't see that one. That little, that little red one there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Even in, in real life, I probably wouldn't know what so that they're, they're looking for. What, like uh, those two signs and one on the front. Uh, 
The one on the, 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 the freestanding sign yeah. has just got all the okay. names, so they'll just put their right. name in there. But really, it's just and a drive-through sign. It's a, right. Yeah. Okay. So again, the greater area you you, you can increase beyond the, the 100 cap. Yeah. My read of the way it's talking about what would be allowed by 1907 is that you can't allow somebody to have they have 10 feet of frontage. They can't necessarily now have 30 30 square feet because yeah. they would. You don't want anybody to take up more than what their individual tenant space is. Right. These guys have two. Yeah. Um, I don't think Sorry. they, they're not asking for, nor do I think would be appropriate for them to take all 55 based on their linear frontage. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to understand if, if their signage falls under what the commission looked at with Phelps when they came before you previously. Because these illuminated. Um, they did tell. get when one of the things that the um, Phelps application when it was before you in 2021 did address was the allowing for internal illumination. I thought we did allow it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure if they're necessarily asking for that yet. Um, they just and want, this is the color they want red with the yeah. That's okay. That's that's the. That's the way the logo has been presented, I think, okay. on the building plan. So we're not we're not including the drive through signage. I think I would think that that would be directional as opposed to signage of uh, recognizing the uh, name of the business. Right. Yeah, I, I don't that because all if it says higher collective drive through, then I would be signing. Yes. But because it yes. just says drive through. Yeah. yeah. It, we wouldn't, we would not count that. It's better up there than painted on the ground. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So I, I just, I guess the, the question for me would be, does it need to come before you here? Do, does it, I mean, we would still do a, a staff permit because if there was, we would look at zoning at the staff level for all the same criteria. Well, it means the square footage and so yeah. forth. I, where I don't have a problem with this, what I'm looking at here. Yeah. And they got to advertise their business. Seems yeah. modest. Three by five. Yeah, they yeah. got to try as to long as the their free owner yeah. is all right with yeah, a sign agreed. that's different yeah. than what has been. You have to make sure uniform. that the plaza owner is clear. Well, so the plaza yeah. owner has required all tenants to use the specific sign contractor that came before you in okay. 21. Okay. So they right. have to go to him. Yeah. Okay. And he, his impression was this all falls under the, the application I made to them when we talked about what we would transition the signage to they show the new pylon or freestanding sign and the internal illumination his understanding was it was all covered and so provided they didn't expand beyond the specific front uh, signage allowed for their unit mm -hmm. that they were okay because the sign the signage on the property already exceeds the 100 square feet so that greater sign area is already way way out of the back um, prior to us um, but I just, you know, I want to be very cautious. And so do they. They want to make sure, sure. That, yeah. that everything that they're doing is exactly correct. Okay. Yeah, as long as the owner is okay. That's right. right. feeling. There's no first violations. This is not a bad looking sign. No. No. No, no. Okay. To let them know. And that is all I have. All right, with that being said, it is uh, 8.40, we will adjourn.